Cool. Uh, well, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, it's a very familiar audience, so that's a very comfortable feeling. Uh, today we'll be talking about financialization in Turkey. This panel is uh, organized by the Debt and Financialization Research Network Turkey, the recently founded uh, <coughs> research collaboration network that focuses on issues of debt and financialization in Turkey. We're trying to eliminate different aspects of financialization in Turkey. And we are um, happily supported by the Research Institute on Turkey. You can find more information about this uh, on defire.info. If you're interested, we'll be posting the video recordings of this as well as the audio recordings online and uh, most probably also the presentations uh, if all authors uh, agree to present, uh, to, uh, to publish this. Okay. Both cameraman and moderator here. <laughs> um, thanks so much for the contributions. Um, are there any questions to start off? Yes. Yes. So um, when I came to the room first time, they, there was no one here. Yet Kim was the only person. We ended up talking, and I ended up saying, "I'm kind of older than you are." <laughs> now I listen to all three of you. I feel even older <laughs> because I remember when microcredit first became available. That was Grameen Bank back in 1993, and one of the prerequisites of it was that you give money in small scale, but you did not tell people what to do with it. That was the prerequisite of original microcredit. But when IMF and World Bank adapted this policy, they changed it, to my understanding, as far as I can tell. A, they will still do small loading, but they will also do what to do with them. They will send it. Empowerment, you talked about. I'm wondering, in the Turkish case, what you have presented today, like, this is a question for all of you. Do you consider microcredit as a, a agent of empowerment in a positive sense, or are you are you talking about it from the IMF's perspective or the way the IMF adapted the technique? Um, is it a negative thing? Right? Are, are we collecting questions or? Um. Are there any other questions? Uh, first, I have a question for Yetkin. Uh, it's a very good study, thank you. I haven't come across any study that combines finance and agriculture, so it's very informative. Uh, but I have some hesitations <laughs> about sure. calling this financialization, because it's a very it's something like credit-driven agricultural development. Uh, I couldn't see exactly why we call this financialization. Uh, and I also think that it's important to focus on the unequal relationship between different agents because as you uh, very well tell that this relation is very different between large-scale producers and banks and between small-scale producers and banks and I think this is uh, related to this unequal relationship. As the relation becomes more unequal uh, so exploitation becomes more obvious uh, so I think it's important to focus on this point, the unequal, relation, unequal, uh, relation, uh, unequal power relation between different agents. Yeah. Alright, well, why don't we take the first round of comments on these questions. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, I mean, one can trace back the microcredit phenomena, I believe, even to 1970s or 1980s. Uh, and I agree with you. I mean, it was not uh, commercialized, it was not financial. <coughs> uh, but the 1990s uh, and especially the early 2000s, with the, uh, with the role of huge financial organizations and banks, and new methods to securitize the revenues of microcredits, so it became something else. Um, I'm I'm not sure we can we can take microcredit as an as an instance of empowerment. Uh, I mean, I'm, that's that's why I want to uh, conduct a field research, and uh, I don't know the number of uh, women who have. Uh, benefited from this microcredit campaign in Samsung and uh, the Black Sea region, but I will focus on this uh, region and I will try to understand uh, 
because I believe that no no one asks about the uh, impact of microcredit in in the economy. There is there is this professor uh, Milford Bateman who talks about localization of the economy, uh, but but the, um, there is no such study in Turkey as far as I know. So so uh, so we should look at that. But my concern is that. Uh, we can criticize the state authorities and policymakers uh, in their use of Grameen Bank, in their support to uh, to this uh, association, to this Israel uh, Neva Wakfu, and the use of especially the state-owned banks with commercial <coughs> and for-profit uses, but not for other purposes. We, you you have the uh, huge financial actors, the state-owned banks. But, and thanks to this neoliberal restructuring of these banks, and uh, they have become like for-profit commercial banks, and now uh, extending credit to farmers or extending microcredits are, um, are not on their agenda. So what I try to suggest in the paper is that uh, we need to address, there's a problem there, uh, there's a demand for credit, and I may, I may I may sound like an unmarxist, but I'm 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 going on. <laughs> um, uh, but we should do it with a progressive political agenda uh, that necessitates to reclaim the state-owned banks, that necessitates to reclaim the state branches uh, to do so. To your uh, uh, question first, I'll, I'll just uh, talk about, like, uh, address your question about whether microcredits empower people or is something negative. Uh, um, it is being marketed as something empowering, right? Uh, that's a little bit more of the ideological uh, redressing, maybe, but it's just, I think, the consequence of. A withdrawal of the welfare state and it's just related to that dynamic of like withdrawal of the welfare state and introduction of market mechanisms as kind of like subsidizing people's livelihoods through usage of credits but actually it's not subsidizing it's putting people uh, at a disadvantage at different stages in different perspectives so and microcredits is just like the reflection like of further uh, financial inclusion in that opinion I mean I think it's just it's not a matter of choice that people use their credits uh, in order to get involved in different economic activities but they have to because they don't have any other choice especially when I think about uh, small scale investments mm. would you like to respond to uh, would, you, would you like to go uh, first to Actually, I don't have an answer because yeah. <laughs> that's not a problem in housing, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not an economist. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but if I would say something, I would probably say very similar things to Yetkin. Uh, yeah. If can I have your uh, uh, definition of financialization? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> it, 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 it's real fancy. No, like I, I would give you, but I just to elaborate like your question. Right. Uh, so I think that. There are two aspects of financialization. One of them is uh, making money out of money using financial instruments, right? That's the um, a pattern that uh, economic sociologists as well as economists use, that instead of um, getting profits, driving profits out of uh, manufacturing as well as industrial production, uh, even uh, manufacturing, manufacturing industrial companies are investing in financial instruments to make money. That's, that's one aspect of financialization. The other aspect is, is this, uh, that is related to microcredits, expansion of uh, using credit usage like throughout the society. So, and that's where I'm a little bit more focusing on because I mean, I'm looking at the production sphere and I'm looking at how small scale producers, whereas they were uh, getting benefits uh, from state supports uh, being uh, subsidies like input subsidies or price supports 
different mechanisms of state support right? shifting from all that system to a system where they uh, producing for corporations and have to use credits and that is being introduced as a system and their debt burden is being uh, in, like increased over time as well as uh, their maybe financial inclusion as being part of the financial system as credit takers mm -hmm. right kind of solidifies uh, they become part of this part of the system where they, they have to take it up, right, to use credits and become like rational investors or entrepreneurs. So rather than, I mean, there are those two aspects which go hand in hand in my opinion. And that's, it, it doesn't, of course not, this study doesn't uh, explain anything about uh, derivative markets there, uh, like Koray Chilishkan uh, had worked on that area, had a book about that, right, to, how the prices of cotton actually is a, a result of speculation rather than uh, the price they farmers get at the farm gate, right? Like the, when they sell it, the prices is, is being determined somewhere else out on the derivative markets in, in future uh, markets and so on. So I'm, I'm not looking at that area, but I'm looking at more at the impacts of credit usage as a consequence of financialization as a yeah. consequence of credit expansion. That's, that's how I relate the work. Uh, okay, this makes uh, it better if you say that uh, how agriculture has changed as a uh, result of financialization. Because yeah. uh, what uh, I understand from financialization is something, a major change in the relations between banks, the real sector and the households, and it came from the uh, real sector, so it's something uh, more major. Uh, and Actually, why I asked uh, this question uh, was because uh, you talked about 1980s in US. So I think uh, th uh, during those times it wasn't called as financialization. Mm -hmm. And it's something very similar to what happened today in Turkey. So it wasn't financialization and why this is financialization. Yeah. So it's more like credit driven agricultural development uh, uh, happening in a world which is financialized. I see. I mean, I think the, we see the. Uh, dynamics a little bit later than I mean Turkey is a little, of course it's not uh, let's say developed European country but I think in terms of its economic structure it resembles a little more like continental European systems yeah. at least sure. in in, uh, in agriculture so um, we see a more we, s we had a more active involvement of state in agriculture mm -hmm. whereas that started changing in the United States much earlier in the 1980s with the uh, consecutive like financial uh, in, sorry, at, um, instabilities in commodity markets and in prices especially in agriculture and related to that the burden of the that burden of uh, farmers in the United States so we see I don't know like what happened in the United States here it's kind of happened a little bit lagged uh, later in Turkey, I mean, it's not this often. It's not the similar, same thing. Dynamics all are different. But in terms of uh, just looking at the impacts of um, credit debt mm -hmm. on like farming households, we can, we can make an uh, analogy between those. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, the cr credit system a lot was a lot more established here in the United States uh, in farming than in Turkey uh, back then. So. Yeah, I want to ask a more comparative uh, question. Um, so if I understand correctly, financial inclusion can happen through housing or it can happen through agriculture. Um, and so these two things are uh, part of what makes financial inclusion, um, if I understand. Yeah, you know, it can be put that uh, way. But, but financial inclusion is, uh, if, if it is uh, what I understand, um, that it's uh, in inclusion in the system, really, in the financial system, and this most likely happens through credit, through debt. Yeah. Um, so comparatively, for example, um, uh, comparing to the United States, um, what percentage of uh, households, for example, we, we know that a household debt has increased uh, tremendously in the past uh, 10, 12 years. Um, 
uh, has financial inclusion increased with the same rate um, uh, as the as the vac as the uh, volume of the of, of debt, um, and how is that how is that related? And comparatively with the United States, like what percentage of the population are uh, finan are uh, financially included um, in Turkey as opposed to to here maybe in also uh, specifically in the in housing and, and in agriculture. Um, regarding the uh, y y the debt figures in the United States uh, and their change, I don't know. I ha I have to look, but I mean I can uh, say that in in the global north and countries like United States, uh, the according to the World Bank data, this uh, global FINDEX 2014, uh, it. It revolves around 90%. 90% of the population is um, defined as financially included. They benefit from the services of formal financial system, um, and the ratio declines sharply when it comes to countries like Turkey and countries of the global south. In Turkey, it changed slightly. Uh, I don't remember the. Global Findex 2014, but Global Findex 2011, uh, 30, 32 percent of uh, men, adult men, did not have a bank account in 2011, and it was 80, 81 percent of women. Uh, so overall, um, it was like a half, a half of the population uh, was considered to be financially excluded. It changed slightly in the last three years, but I don't remember the exact ratio in Global Findex uh, 2014. Uh, so, is there is there a dramatic change in this ratio uh, that goes parallel to the change in the volume of the household <coughs> debt? Yeah, the in problem. The past ten years. Yeah, like, the problem is, is that also the problem the is that you can uh, one can calculate this for probably for the United States and uh, but um, the data uh, is compiled from 2011 onwards for index uh, composed by Turkey uh, Turkey Economy Bank 2013 onwards so we do not know mm -hmm. the situation in 2005 or 2006 uh, but still uh, it seems that there's a slight increase uh, people who are uh, benefiting from financial services, let's say. Uh, but if you look at the credit card owners, of course, as uh, studies, as A, for example, shows in one of her studies, uh, the number of credit card owners increased dramatically in, from 2003 to 2008. Mm. Uh, and there are some uh, reports compo uh, written by FESU team, Financialization Economy Society and Sustainable Development Team, uh, which Özlem and Elif are a part. Uh, so these reports uh, uh, show that in the, under the rule of Justice and Development Party, uh, the use of consumer credit increased tremendously. And thanks to this credit consumption boom, people so became much more a part of the financial system. So that, that may be an answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can reach the report public, it's public, the report is public on the page of mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> I have a comment question for uh, Agriza. Uh, you talked about three main pillars uh, related to financial inclusion. And, uh, I thought that in the case of Turkey, we might include one more, uh, which might be more rele relevant uh, indeed, and it is related to the uh, law that passed in 2010, as far as I remember. Uh, after this uh, legisla legislation, it became compulsory for uh, companies which employ uh, employee more than 10, I think, to deposit uh, wages and salaries through banks. And it was a major step for financial inclusion. 
and one of the main aims of this law was to prevent informal sector. So actually, I was surprised to hear that in, the, in these last reports, they don't talk about informal sector, because it's a very good way to uh, legitimize financial inclusion in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they were talking about this before, I know, but uh, probably in the last course uh, the emphasis shifted on something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, the Global Development Report uh, of 2014 and this re recent uh, policy paper by Demir Güçkunt, mm -hmm. uh, they mentioned uh, this as an opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. If you make the corporations pay through banks, if you, if the states decide to pay through banks, deposit the uh, money into banks, this will help uh, increase financial awareness, financial inclusion, mm -hmm. etc. So, so th they do not mention this in this strategy document, but mm -hmm. probably uh, in 2017 and 2018 we will see another round of action plans and strategy documents. Probably uh, this will this will become a uh, this will be this will take its place in, mm -hmm. the, in these documents. But I don't know how to frame it as a pillar, mm. uh, because despite the law that you mentioned, uh, uh, I mean, it's it's um, it has not turned into a <coughs> campaign, just just a law that that make it uh, obligatory to deposit if you deposit <coughs> into banks if you employ more than mm. ten people, mm. but. Yeah, they uh, they find their way yeah. in Turkey. Yeah. The informal uh, As always. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sector will not decline because of this law. <laughs> it's so obvious. But I think it's important because uh, this gives banks an opportunity to to, uh, to service many other financial services. You know, to provide, mm -hmm. to encourage the use of uh, credit cards, yeah, uh, market credits, yeah, like yeah. housing credit, and uh, other stuff for workers and for their families as well. I know many instances in which they send credit cards to the addresses when they have a when a worker have a bank uh, deposit in mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. All right, let me follow up with a more general word of questions. So, there are different ways of defining financialization. You know, you can look at it from an institutional perspective of who's, what institutions or agents are included. You can look at it from a perspective of uh, how, you know, the ways, uh, how actions change. You know? But the common thread throughout all these presentations today seems to be, at least, you know, in the realm of Turkey, the state is one of the key actors, both in shaping the institutions as well as shaping the actions. Uh, driving institutionalization, uh, from financialization. So my question to probably all of you is, why? Like, what's the logic behind the government's actions, or you know, the or the sequence of governments? What what's the why would a government or and many governments in sequence uh, pursue a broad scale uh, policy of financialization in realms ranging from agriculture, household finance, housing finance? consumer credit, so on and so forth. I would suggest to frame the question, uh, reframe the question, because, um, and it can be formulated as a critique to the literature of financialization. Uh, it's a tendency to take credit money, credit relations as given. But it's, as we know, it's, something always constructed and needs always to be regulated and reframed. So the state has to be there always. Uh, it's, it's the problem of the scholars and researchers that do not take into account when they talk about the increased revenues uh, from financial operations, increased revenues of non <coughs> corporations. It's a, it's a problem. You, they should take into account the role of the state. Uh, the legal regulations and the restructuring of the state. And in Turkish case, uh, that, was my, that was my research about in previous years. We need to take into account the state fictitious capital in 1980s and 1990s. We need to take into account the construction of the sovereign debt market in Turkey, which, uh, which was also the construction of the mechanism that enabled a huge transfer from public to financial capital. Um, but still, 
uh, still we can I mean uh, we can question the centrality of states uh, probably more than other places other other countries in global south maybe um, but I don't have an answer for that and I need to think about that uh, okay in let's say in geography the relation between states and space is a big thing of course uh, but from my perspective and especially for Turkey there are two things related to the state the first thing is rescaling of the state is a major issue in Turkey in the, uh, the transformation of space and the second thing is the special intervention of the state so how state intervenes through the processes so in, a, in the Marxist literature of course this is this is ar argued in the Marxist literature so there are other discussions in non-Marxist literature uh, but in, a, in the Marxist literature the whole literature is mainly domi dominated by regulationist school and especially by Jessup and which reframes regulationism through strategies and strategic relation approach. But for me, I think uh, there's, an, there's another answer for that beyond regulation school. It's coming from a much more open Marxist perspective and understanding state not as the, uh, let's say, the hub of collecting all the uh, pressures and then deciding what to do as interventions. They call it selectivity, that's why they call it selectivity and selects what to do next. Rather, the state works as, an, um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a social unity uh, which works uh, through, the, uh, which uh, gives responses to the conflicts which are created through the relations between, between the developer and the developers, between the state and the developer. So, so the state tries to respond to that crisis but of course it's not possible to overcome them so that's why it is a process and that's why we don't call it selectivity and that's why it, is, it includes relations that's why it is an intervention so it is a whole process like a historical process but also it changed through time and through, through different uh, through different localities as we see in the Turkish case for example in Istanbul uh, the the national state or even the local state did not intervene similarly in uh, scattered settlements when they were doing the urban regeneration. They were all different. So the state was the same state, but the interventions were different. So I think what we need to see is uh, in the special transformation uh, the two things, the rescaling and the interventions of uh, the state, but for the, the, role, the, the major role of Turkey, the major role of the state in Turkey uh, especially in the special development, is a he they, they have a huge land stock, uh, especially in the valuable lands of the cities, so it is a big plus for the state. And uh, also, uh, the urban regeneration process targeted the whole neighborhood, uh, it is the first time which, uh, which was targeted in the whole neighborhood, because it was normally the apartments or the, the one house itself, so the resistance against urban regeneration was coming from the whole neighborhood. That's why the national state must be there to respond it. It wasn't possible to do by any other force. So there, I mean, there, there are different uh, let's say peculiarities of the Turkish state itself, but I think I agree with uh, Aliza. Uh, I think the role of the state is uh, major in all of the countries. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will agree with that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like the uh, state that we need to have regulation to have markets, right? Like, so we, we cannot have markets without the rules. And but like, how those are how how those rules are being determined or set is is a really active process, as Islam said, is an active process of negotiation. But I find Jessup's argument like really useful because I think he adds a lot and that's a little bit of a theoretical uh, discussion we can go on all about yeah, that so. later too but I think the uh, uh, how the state like the regulating mechanisms react upon uh, different cases differently 
even though you have the same regulating mechanism, I think this is very much related with with just uh, well, not like wild contingency, but uh, th there is a lot of like ec economic as well as extra economic dynamics. So, and uh, just going back to the to the to the essence of the question, why does state intervene? Makes all these regulations or uh, why is it necessary for state involvement for for us to have the the process called financialization, right? So that's the kind of the essence of the question. Or why why do we see it being so active in financialization as though we are we, we don't want to think about the state, but just like the market mechanisms in financialization. Maybe, but my question was also about why the state. If the state is engaged in it, why would it use, you know, methods of financialization? Ah. Like, what's? I'll I'll give you a real orthodox answer then. Just crisis crisis of capitalism, right? <laughs> so I mean, because state doesn't have any other choices, I guess, right? So it, uh, globalization. It, yeah, so, I mean globalization as well as, I mean, the, the financial crisis, the budget crisis started, in, starting in the late seventies and. Especially in the Turkish context, crisis that followed like eighties, nineties, the state had no other choice, I guess, to. I mean, seeing all the financial, uh, of course, you, everyone can contribute on that, but uh, state seeing no other uh, choices in terms of uh, based on the forest or state-supported uh, capitalism, sustain that model of capitalism. Had in order to uh, go on with the type of capitalism, they had to shift to to a more pre for this capitalism that we've seen before the 1930s or so. I mean, of course, it is it is a different form. We have, we have a lot stronger corporations and so on. But uh, I think it is. I mean, Fordism, state-supported capitalism, was a form to to make. Uh, capitalism survive because otherwise it was going to be drawn by it in its own uh, crisis. But then the end of the forest uh, period was the conflicts. I mean, internal conflicts as well as like social all social uh, reactions to that and everything. Like we shouldn't really exclude uh, social dynamics from kind of, we cannot really explain everything about economic dynamics, right? But I think it's just uh, the merger of all these dynamics. Uh, that, that's the thing that brought us here, I guess. So. <laughs> um, to yet again, to clarify uh, your conclusion uh, about the study, uh, you're, you're not uh, saying that we should get rid of this dispossession argument, right? Yeah. yeah. Just uh, it depends on the sector, it depends on the geography, it depends on the region. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there is, in terms of uh, defaults, like uh, defaults on credits, let's say when we look at uh, total credit use, compare that to defaults, like credits not being able to be repaid mm -hmm. by farmers, it's like around 4%. It's been like in 2008, I guess, like the earliest data that I could find according to the uh, banking regulation agency. And then uh, it didn't, that person, that proportion did not change too much. It was like between 3 and 4% uh, at the end of like, 2014. Of course, it shows an increase over time. I mean, I'm using obviously the uh, default credit rates as an indicator of dispossession. Right? Mm -hmm. So, but uh, I mean, it, we have this possession, definitely. But then there is like an ongoing business, right? Ongoing participation of small-scale farmers, or small-scale investors uh, who are using who use credits. I'm trying to explain, uh, in a way, one of the potential consequences. What what happens to those people? So uh, that's one thing. And, and another thing, maybe about this possession, especially in agricultural production. So. I said like there was a decrease in agricultural employment from eight million to six million, but actually it was worse uh, mid two thousands. Like uh, number of pr uh, uh, people working in agricultural employment went down to five million people 
and then over time it increased like gradually by one million. With, uh, someone needs to look at that, like about why the why that happened, uh, how that happened, right? Because there are different subsidies now in uh, uh, state support subsidies uh, for di different sectors, but in different forms in order to integrate producers more in corporate markets uh, rather than the state being the active uh, regulate uh, like active purchaser, right? active customer uh, through different uh, mechanisms. So uh, there has been like a really dip, like really strong dip, uh, decline over time, but then there's been a, uh, since 2006 or 2007, there has been like a really slow increase. So uh, my point is we cannot really talk about a really strong trend of dispossession, right? There is still, the majority of producers are still there uh, there has been losses, right? Uh, we need to, of course, look at uh, uh, who has been exploited a lot more in detail. But yeah, I'm basically saying that uh, dispossession and exploitation through different mechanisms go hand in hand uh, together. Maybe I'll play the devil's advocate then we'll follow up on <laughs> if, uh, the, So if you, if you read in a graver, David Graeber, you know, he's, you know, he refers to all these uh, extensive history of credit and how they essentially originated from agricultural relationships. Right? The, the seasonal issue of you know, crops that you have to you know, plant the seeds, so you have to take out the loans as a farmer from the merchant home most probably, and then you know, until when, when harvesting season comes around, you can actually repay the merchant with uh, the harvest. Um, so in that sense, maybe agriculture is the origin of financialized industry, right? So my question would be, what's different about it now? Mm. Yeah. And the second question that I would like to ask is about you know, this position defined in terms of defaults, right? You, you know, appropriation of um, uh, the property of the farmer by the bank. From the perspective of the bank, it's not necessarily a good thing, right? Banks, banks won't try to avoid defaults, mm -hmm. okay? Especially on property, on assets that have a falling value. Mm -hmm. So maybe uh, exploitation or dispossession does not necessarily manifest itself through the default, through mm -hmm. the formal legal transfer of property, but through the mechanisms in you know, how farmers operate. Right? The, the, people, you know, the, 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 the bigger kind of the share of revenue that goes to credit repayments, that's the uh, dispossession, not necessarily the default or the transfer assets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. But those are really good points. So what is different is that, uh, I mean, uh, I tried to address that question. Good. I, I got that question previously as well. The, the thing is that um, we had that pattern, right, like in agriculture, but a lot more at smaller scale, especially in, in Turkish case, because uh, the commercialization in Turkey was not as extensive. Uh, as now, previous. Right now, like everyone is, like all, most of the household, we cannot talk about like subsistence farmers anymore, or like a really, really, really marginal part, where like someone just consumes whatever they produce and they don't sell anything else. We can, we are talking about more like smaller scale commercial farms, who like maybe have like a plot for themselves to uh, uh, sustain their subsistence, their livelihood, but at the same time, uh, probably. Uh, bigger portion of their production is for cash, right? To, to earn credits, uh, to earn, sorry, money, profits. And we had that system, the uh, uh, consolidation of that simple commodity production system throughout the welfare system, the welfare state period, like from 30s up to 80s in, in Turkey. And that really, that was heavily supported by uh, state enterprises as well as like, state support, state subsidies and so on. So what, what is different now is that the expansion of that uh, credit dependent production system. So the scale is different first and uh, that uh, credit uh, dependent production uh, oriented, uh, targeted at, directed at uh, corporations needs, right? Trying to meet corporations demands. So that is uh, something uh, very new as well. Like the, this is really, previously we had like uh, smaller merchants, small scale merchants who are more interested in exporting maybe, but like the extent of that 
does at a smaller scale. Whereas now the credit dependent production pretty much defies the system, right? So that is the difference. And that's why we can talk more about a, a shift in the regime and the, in the accumulation system. And so that's, that will be my um, uh, answer to that. And uh, whether defaults are a good uh, proxy for dispossession and if exploitation or not. The loss of profits to corporations could be uh, described as dispossession. I think that like dispossession is a really useful concept, but I think we need to uh, define it a little bit more concisely, you know, like have some limits because we can uh, define anything as dispossession. So dispossession really means that uh, that you have to hand over something, right? Either, either by force or by uh, as a result of uh, like your credit debt, you have to lose it. So it's, it's a really common story in, in Turkey that people use their, lose their investments, lose their uh, land, or uh, like their tractors, other inputs they have, the investments they had. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know if it is uh, probably what, what you say is makes a lot of sense that banks wouldn't want to uh, appropriate but still get paid, right? Because it will be fast for them like, to appropriate, take that uh, asset and try to sell it or, or maybe run by themselves, right? But uh, there is like appropriation going on as well. And uh, there, there are times that farmers just commit suicide uh, because they have uh, overwhelmed by that, right? Uh, in Turkey, it's an increasing uh, trend all that stuff covered in newspapers, right? And then, I mean, if you look at other countries where there's heavier uh, debt burden, like India, uh, farmer suicide is a, is a big issue, right? And that that comes as a result of uh, debt burden and people not really knowing how what to do, what else to do uh, as a result of this process. So, uh, and I think default, even though no, I didn't explain, all the dispossession, it might be manageable, like the uh, credits on default uh, might be managed somehow, uh, might be renegotiated, there might be, uh, I don't know what it is called in English, but the state might uh, forgive the debts and so on, because in, in Turkey especially, most of the agricultural debt, like agricultural credits provided by uh, a culture bank, which is a public bank, right? Uh, so, uh, but, it is, it is defaults are related to this possession and it is happening, so. Uh, I think, um, isn't it also possible that a big uh, portion of this possession might happen to prevent defaults? Mm. Like they could be selling their house, they could be selling their tractor, mm. their, their car, like yeah. they could be dispossessing yeah. to prevent uh, default and they make the payment to the bank yeah. and they close their credit card or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's another thing, but that shows itself as like withdrawal, withdrawing from the sector, right? So yeah. then we, we, that's actually might be one of the factors why we see less and less people participating, like a decline in the number of producers. So yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the factors. And probably one very obvious you know, example of dispossession is urban renewal, right? Yeah. yeah. When you have to turn over your house first, and mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of the, uh, probably the most explicit portion of it. All right. Uh, are there any more questions? If not, then I would like to thank the audience and the panelists here today, and uh, we'll be posting the video, depending on how fast we can edit the. Uh, probably this sometime this week, I presume. And you can find that video on our website and also I'll post it on Facebook, uh, just in case uh, you don't get to the website. Thanks. <laughs>